Welcome to Too Fond of Books. My name is Janelle and this is a reading roundup. In this video I'm going to share with you uh, the, some of the books that I have read recently, but first I have some really exciting news. We just put up a little free library in our front yard and I am so excited about that. So I'm going to insert a clip here so that you can see our little free library. So exciting news, our little free library is up. I will just walk a bit closer and you can see our cool little free library. My father-in-law made it and uh, we finally had it put up on the weekend. We've already had some activity, so already books being exchanged, so it's very exciting. I love that we have a little free library. The first book that I want to talk about is called Murder at Blackwater Bend by Clara McKenna, and I'm going to put, I'll insert a picture um, of it here. This was a book that I received from NetGalley, uh, an advanced copy to read. It's coming out at the end of June this year. And it's the second in a series. It's a historical mystery series, which I love. And it's set in 1905, which is a great time period. I really like that Edwardian time period. And there actually aren't a ton of historical mysteries set during that time period. So I was already primed to really like this book. Um, it is the second Stella and Lindy mystery, and I have not read the first, but I will definitely try and get my hands on the first to read after this one. And it's set in the New Forest, which is in Hampshire, which is an area of England that I, I really like. I, we, I've been there, I've, I've visited the area, um, and I actually have... Um, my great-grandparents are from uh, Southampton, which is in uh, Hampshire. And so, uh, yeah, so I just really enjoyed the setting. I thought that was really good too. So, uh, what is this book about? Stella is an American heiress who is engaged to Lindy. Um, and the two of them are fishing in the Blackwater Bend, the river, one morning when Stella discovers the body of Lord Fairbrother in the stream. And um, then, of course, the police are called and uh, investigations ensue. Stella is a great character. She's an American um, and so she's trying to navigate this world of the aristocracy in England, which is very entertaining. And so she doesn't behave maybe exactly how she's expected to behave. Uh, Lindy's mother, Lindy is um, the son of an earl. So uh, he is the son of Lord and Lady Atherley who live at Monnington Hall. And they are, it's kind of one of those classic situations of, you know, they have land, they have title, but they have no money. And Stella is um, an American. Her father is very rich, but would love the title and the, the land and that kind of reputation. So it's kind of one of those, um, she's kind of from that era of the American heiress, which I always thought was really, uh, really interesting. Lady Philippa Fairbrother is the wife of Lord Fairbrother, who is the one who gets killed. And we find out in the story that she has a past with Lindy. The two of them um, were supposed to get engaged. And actually, Lindy's mother is, throughout the book, really trying to convince Lindy to drop Stella and um, marry Lady Philippa. There is an interesting character called Harvey. He is a snake catcher who lives in the area. Um, and ugh, I really don't like snakes, but uh, he was an interesting character. Um, and then the inspector, it's Inspector Brown who investigates. So this was a great kind of classic mystery in that there was the setup and you met the characters and you you were able to identify potential suspects and then you had the murderer 
and the investigation and the conclusion. And this, this honestly really was my kind of mystery. I really enjoyed it. So the suspects, of course, were uh, Harvey, the snake catcher, who publicly blamed uh, Fairbrother for burning down his cottage. We have Parley, who is a landowner who publicly accuses Fairbrother of fixing the pony competition, uh, which was very important, uh, very important competition in the area. Philippa, the wife, is obviously a suspect. Uh, someone called Cecil Barlow. And then there's this unknown woman. Um, there is a scene right near the beginning with this unknown woman and fair brother. Uh, and she is obviously meant to be a suspect as well. So one thing that I, I just really enjoyed about this book was, like I said already, the setting and the time period. So it's the new forest in 1905. And one of the things that I found so interesting was how the author used uh, elements of that area as important parts of the story. So rather than just choosing this area and slipping stuff in randomly, they were important parts of the story. So for example, the rights of common in the new forest were an important part of the story and really interesting to read about. So Harvey's cottage, for example, the one that he blames Fairbrother for burning down, he didn't own the land. He was actually squatting in the cottage, but he was allowed rights of estovers and turbery, which is to collect the firewood and harvest turf. Um, uh, so he was allowed the, the rights of his hut, those rights because his hut incorporated the old hearth of the Norley cottage to which the rights were attached. So I mean, it's very convoluted and complicated and I really like that idea of like ancient rights and ancient rules and how those things worked. And so he was allowed to harvest turf and collect firewood because the cottage he was living in had the hearth, the fireplace and the chimney of this old cottage and the rights were attached to that cottage. And so when the fireplace chimney was dis destroyed in the fire, his rights were forfeit. And so he had um, obviously good reason to be angry at whoever burnt down his cottage. The other interesting thing that they talked about was the Verderer's Court. Fairbrother, um, it was the official Verderer. And the court is the governing body charged as guardian of the new forest, its landscape, and its inhabitants. And that becomes an important part of the story as well. I just dropped, dropped my notes. <laughs> so yeah, so uh, I made a note too that this was a nice complicated plot with lots of suspects, lots of side issues, suspicion, clues, and red herrings. It's exactly the kind of mystery that I like. And I gave it um, four stars and uh, I really enjoyed that one. So thanks to NetGalley and the publisher for sending me a copy of that to review. Next up I read Death and the Maiden by Sheila Radley. This is the first in her Inspector Quantrill series and I really actually really like this. This was from the 70s. This was published in 1978. So I was a little bit concerned about how dated it was, but actually it's held up fairly well. It, I wasn't super distracted by dated um, elements in the story. I actually quite like this. So a girl has drowned in a shallow brook surrounded by wild flowers and um, and it was the first time that Chief Inspector Quantrill who works in the small East Anglian district of Ashthorpe and Beckenham Market had heard of Ophelia. So she was found in the stream surrounded by flowers. Um, and so that's obviously like an Ophelia reference, but he had never heard of that before. It was, a, it was just a good classic mystery. I quite liked this one as well. I gave that one four stars. In this one, he gets uh, his new sergeant who uh, becomes a part of the series as well. His new sergeant was called, um, hang on, Tate, Sergeant Tate, uh, who, who is kind of one of those 
educated up-and-comers um, and so there was a, so there was some good conflict between Quantrill and Tate uh, but you can see developing a good working relationship as well um, so yeah it was it was a good mystery was this girl killed uh, murdered first of all was a, a, an important question for them to answer and then uh, once they knew that uh, who who did kill her and so yeah it was pretty good and I actually really enjoy Sheila Radley's writing uh, let me read you uh, the opening paragraph to get an idea the river Dunnock rises without much enthusiasm in the northern uplands of Suffolk and sets out in the direction of the wash taking its time over the journey a narrow shallow brook of a river not navigable at any point in its meanderings nor deep enough to swim in and nowhere deep enough for an 18 year old girl to drown unless she chose to end her life or unless someone intended that she should die the body lay barely afloat in the shallows long hair waving indistinguishably among the river weed some yards downstream from ashthorpe bridge so yeah that's death and the maiden by sheila radley and then i read um another one of joan aiken's Jane Austen sequels. This is actually the first that she wrote and it's called Mansfield Revisited and she wrote this in 1984. So right away I thought that it was very interesting that she chose Mansfield Park as the first of Jane Austen's works to do a sequel to. I thought that was very interesting um, because Mansfield Park isn't anybody I know's favorite Jane Austen. Um, I'm sure it's somebody's, but I actually don't know anybody who would say Mansfield Park is their favorite. And if people were to list all six of Jane Austen's completed works in order of favorites, Mansfield Park would generally be found nearer the bottom than the top, I would imagine. So I found it very interesting that she chose this one. I wonder if she chose it for that reason. Potentially she chose it because it was her own favorite. I'm not entirely sure. Um, but she chose to set this four years after the events of Mansfield Park. And her main character is Susan Price, who is Fanny's little sister, who comes to live at Mansfield Park at the end of Jane Austen's book. Um, I would say that uh, Joan Aiken managed to stay true to the world and characters that Jane Austen created while telling her own story. And so I think it's really difficult for authors to choose to do retellings or sequels to famous classics like Jane Austen. But in this case, I thought Joan Aiken did a really good job of kind of straddling that line. She was true to Jane Austen, the world that she created and the characters that she created while telling her own story. And so there was a couple things that she did that really helped. First of all, the book opens with the death of Sir Thomas Bertram, who is the master of the house, if you will, from Mansfield Park from the from the book. And so with his death, there were um, business things that needed to happen in Antigua and Lady Bertram did not want Tom to go. He should go because he's the eldest son. He is now the the sir. Uh, you know, he's taken over um, the land and the estates and the title from his father. But because of his um, illness from the previous book from four years earlier, she was quite concerned. And so Edmund is tasked to go to Antigua, which means that he is out of the picture for a good six months. And um, Fanny chooses to go with him. And so she takes their youngest who is still a baby and the two of them depart uh, in the, within the first chapter of the book. And so I thought that was actually really smart to get rid of the, the main characters from Mansfield Park, Fanny and Edmund, uh, so that there is no um, maybe confusion over who is the main character because that's Susan, not Fanny in this book. Um, so it was, I thought it was a smart move to remove Fanny and Edmund from the story. And um, we don't ever actually see Fanny in this book. We hear about her and Edmund is in the first chapter, but Fanny is never 
on the page. She is uh, re referred to and talked about as being around before they leave, but we never actually hear directly from from Fanny. And I thought that that was actually a smart move. And I really enjoyed this story. Um, I ended up giving it four and a half stars. Uh, of course, Susan uh, is going to fall in love and end up marrying somebody. You know that's going to happen because that's classic uh, <laughs> Jane Austen. And um, I was a little bit concerned with where that was heading, but in the end, uh, I kind of liked uh, how it played out. Uh, there are definite characters from the first book that are still in here. So Tom plays a, a big role in this story. Lady Bertram plays a big role. Julia plays a big role. And uh, the Crawfords come back. Uh, and so, and we all love the Crawfords, don't we? We love, we love to hate them. And so Henry and um, his sister, oh, I just totally forgot her name. Um, Mary. Henry and Mary come back, and this was just a really enjoyable read. I, I quite enjoyed it. And uh, Susan was an interesting character. She was similar to Fanny in certain ways, uh, but was her own person, had her own character, and had her own personality. And so yeah, I really enjoyed Mansfield Revisited by Joan Aiken. And then I read Whiskey from Small Glasses by Denzel, Denzel Mayrick. This is the first in the DCI Daily uh, series and is set in um, Scotland. No. Yes. Set in Scotland. Sorry. <laughs> the west coast of Scotland. I got confused for a second whether it was maybe Ireland, but it's not. This was first published in 2012 and this was pretty this was pretty good. It was uh, kind of a classic police procedural in in a way. So he's from Glasgow, but he gets sent to this small town right on the coast um, because of the um, the bodies that have been found. Um, Far from home and his troubled marriage, it seems that Dal Daly's biggest obstacle will be managing the difficult local police chief. But when the prime suspect is gruesomely murdered, the inquiry begins to stall. As the body count rises, Daly uncovers a network of secrets and corruption in the close-knit community of Kinloch, thrusting him and his loved ones into the center of a case more deadly than he ever imagined. So yeah, it was pretty good. Uh, I enjoyed this one as well and gave it four stars. And if I ever find more in the series, I would totally read them. And then I read a, um, a short, I would say this is more of a novella. Um, oh yeah, it says on the back, a short, sharp shot of crime. So this is The Perfect Murder by Peter James. Peter James is uh, famous for his Roy Grace series, which I quite enjoy. And uh, this is a, a novella um, with the tagline, Marriage Can Be Murder. This was an enjoyable read, but I didn't find anything fantastic about it. I gave it three stars. I liked it. I read it quick in, in one sitting. Um, basically, this is about a couple who are deeply unsatisfied in their marriage and both of them are planning to kill the other. <laughs> without the other knowing. And so basically it's a race to the finish, who who kills who and uh, and what happens with that. And so it was enjoyable, uh, but yeah, I'm gonna pass it along to someone else who is looking for a short, sharp shot of crime. And then I read another book from that I got from NetGalley and it was called Death in Delft. And it was, uh, it's coming out in, or it has come out this year, just very recently, um, by Graham Brack. And this is another historical mystery. And I gave it three stars because I did enjoy it, but there was just, there wasn't anything kind of enough to bring it up to four stars for me, if you know what I mean. Like there was nothing like super exciting about the plot or the characters that kind of made it kind of really special. It was a good solid historical mystery and I liked it. Um, and that's why I gave it three stars. So in this book, it's seven, or sorry, 1671 
and our main character is Master Mercurius. He is sent to Delft. He is on the faculty at the University of Leiden. He is sent to Delft to investigate the disappearance of three girls. Three eight-year-old girls have been abducted and one of them has been found dead. And so it's, it's kind of a great kind of plot for, for a historical mystery. I wonder if part of the reason why um, I liked it but didn't love it is because I'm not super familiar with the history of Holland or the Netherlands. I'm not entirely sure kind of what is the proper name in this situation, but I'm not super familiar with their the history of that country. And so um, I was in a completely new world. Um, as far as the time period, either so I'm not super familiar with the country itself or its history and so that could have something to do with it. Uh, Master Mercurius is an interesting character for sure. He is an ordained priest in the Reformed Church but he is also secretly an ordained Catholic priest which is an interesting uh, an interesting uh, thing and an interesting thing for him to to live with um, and so people who are also kind of secretly Catholic uh, kind of picked him out or knew uh, but uh, he had to keep it secret although it didn't seem to be at that point in time overly important for him to keep it secret I think he, he did want to but I don't know how dangerous it was at that exact moment in time although the official religion at that point would have been the reformed church uh, the Protestant church so, um, the, the setting though and the time period were well evoked. I enjoyed reading about what it was like to live uh, in Delft at that time period, what the people were like. Um, the story takes place over one week and I really enjoyed that structure in the book. So it opens with a prologue of an older Mercurius writing his recollection of the events and then each chapter is a different day in the week and then there is an epilogue, uh, epilogue short, sorry. Uh, he included a character of, uh, of a real person, likely more than one, but as I said, I'm not super familiar with that country or that time period, so I may have missed it, but he included Vermeer, the painter, um, which I thought was very interesting because he included him in a fascinating way, actually, because Vermeer was asked to draw the crime scene. Now, they didn't have where the girl that they found was killed, but they found her grave. She was buried in a shallow grave, and Vermeer drew the area uh, for those people who came later. So, for example, Mercurius came after the events. She had been found already, it had been a few days. So all he really had to kind of orient himself was this picture that Vermeer drew. So I thought that was interesting. And then, of course, because the other two girls are missing, um, and they're looking for them. Vermeer also ends up making portraits of the girls so that they can show what these girls look like to people. So I thought that was an interesting kind of like modern day investigative t techniques, but in 1671. This book was shortlisted for the CWA de debut Dagger Award in 2014. So this book is actually a reissue. In 2014, it was called The Allegory of Art and Science which just strictly personally, I prefer that name to Death in Delft, but, um, but that's fine. Uh, and so it was shortlisted for the Crime Writers Association Debut Dagger Award. So yeah, it was, it was good. And I, um, I would like to thank NetGalley and the publisher for sending me a copy of that book to review. And then I read another ebook. This is from that I got from my library, the latest in the um, the Maggie Hope series by Susan Elia McNeil, and it was called The King's Justice. This book came out this year as well. It's another historical mystery. Uh, so Maggie Hope is an American who has spent 
um, the war. This book is set during World War II. The whole series is set during World War II. And she has spent all that time in England. And so in the first book of the series, which is called Mr. Churchill's Secretary, she is Mr. Churchill's secretary. And so she's a mathematician. She is very smart. And as the series progressive progresses, she moves from being Churchill's secretary to being part of the um, the SOE, the, the Special Operations Executive, I believe is the name. Um, and so she gets like really involved in uh, kind of espionage and resistance in the war. And in this book, she is back in London, uh, recuperating from events taking place in previous books. And I don't want to give anything away, so I'm not going to say, but she is currently working with a bomb disposal unit, uh, disposing of bombs, live bombs in the city of London. She is obviously dealing with some PTSD. She is drinking far too heavily um, and uh, is, you know, doing things that, that are dangerous, uh, but she doesn't really care at this point. So if obviously disposing of bombs is highly dangerous. She, she rides a motorcycle to get around London and she drives it like far too fast and far too dangerously. Um, but at the beginning of this book, The King's Justice, the blackout beast, who is the killer from a previous book, has been um, tried and is being sentenced. And so he is sentenced to be executed. And so the events of this book all take place between his sentencing and his execution. And um, while he is waiting for his execution, um, there is another killer in London, another sequential killer, as it's called in the book. Um, and in this case, they are finding the bones of people, of men, young men, uh, in suitcases, mostly in or along the river, the River Thames. And uh, so uh, that's being looked into and um, Maggie Hope gets involved in that as well. Now that one, I also, I gave three stars to. Um, it was, it was a good outing in the series, and yet I found um, parts, I think the reason why I gave it three stars instead of four stars was because there were parts of the book that just were really preachy. Um, there was a lot about um, capital punishment because the, this blackout beast guy, Nicholas Ryder, I think is his name, he was um, sentenced to death. He was going to be hanged. I think they hanged people then. Anyways, um, and so there was a lot about, you know, capital punishment. Is that appropriate? What should we be doing? All of that kind of stuff. And there were times when the book, I felt, just got a little bit preachy. So I gave it three stars. And then I read the fourth, I think it's the fourth in the Thursday Next series, First Among Sequels by Jasper Ford. And I gave this four stars. I love this series. Um, I'm not going to say too much because it's it's far enough in the series. I don't want to wreck anything if you've never read it. Um, but it is quirky. It is different. And uh, she is a literary detective. Um, and I just really enjoy this series very much. So if you like things that are a little bit quirky, this book also, this book in particular, all of them, but this book in particular, there is so much uh, literary, there are so many literary references. They talk about other books and characters and I just really like that. I am just all in for Thursday Next and the world that she lives in. And what's interesting is that this, this particular one, First Among Sequels, takes place 14 years after the events of the third book in the series, uh, which I thought was very interesting. So yeah, four stars. I love this series. And then I read The Wrong Girl by Hank Philippi, Philippa uh, Ryan. Sorry, I'm not sure how to say that name. Uh, and this is a um, kind of police procedural, I guess you would say, thriller. Um, and I gave this one three stars as well. This came out in 2013. And um, the main character is a Boston newspaper reporter. 
Okay, and then finally I read Plague by Julie Anderson. This was another book that I received from uh, NetGalley, so I uh, want to say thank you to them and to Claret Press, who are publishing it. This book is coming out in September, and it is uh, set in modern-day London. And so, uh, yeah, I enjoyed this. I gave it four stars. It was a good, fast-paced read. Uh, there was a lot of politics in it, police procedure. There was a lot about power and reputation. And uh, and yeah, so it was really enjoyable. It had a good structure of there was a prologue and then each chapter was a day of the week and then the epilogue was a week later. So I enjoy that condensed structure. I feel like it adds to um, the tension in the story uh, and it, it ensures good pacing uh, because everything's told within the, the span of basically a week. Uh, so general plot synopsis, Cassandra Fortune is our main character and she is a civil servant who is working in the Deputy Prime Minister's office and she is um, sent to visit a newly discovered plague pit um, in uh, an area where there's a project that has been stopped, which is why she was sent to go and check out what was causing this, the, the break in this project. So she's, she's with other project board members and uh, they, they are going to see this plague pit. And while she's there, she discovers the body of a newly murdered young man. And so the, the police get called D.I. Andrew Rowlands and D.S. Daljeet Patel and um, there are connections between how this young man was murdered and other victims that Rowlands has already been investigating and then on Tuesday Rowlands shows up at Cassandra's office because another young man has been found murdered in a different location but it also happens to be a plague pit and her work pass is found in his jacket pocket. And so the, the police obviously have questions for her, but then um, she gets tasked by the deputy prime minister to shadow the police in their investigations to ensure that there is no scandal attached to the government as a result of this investigation. And it's at this point where we discover her past work history. She used to work at the gov government communications headquarters. Um, and I, being a Canadian, I had no idea what that was. I thought communications, she's obviously in, I don't know, marketing or something. And But she's talking about how she used to investigate and how she used to love being in the know. And so I looked it up only to discover that it's an intelligence agency that are um, continuing the work of the Bletchley Park team. And so fascinating, I had no idea. So she actually has some history here uh, with investigations and being uh, a part of an intelligence agency. And so her and D.I. Rowlands start to investigate these murders. And yeah, like I said, it was really enjoyable. Uh, I gave it four stars and, uh, and yeah, it's a good read. So that's it. That's what I've been reading recently. Have you read any of these books? I'd love to chat with you about that in the comment section down below. And I will see you for another video soon. Bye.